Companies are selfish. You need to be selfish too. You can always ask for more money, but I feel like all of my friends, they think if they go and ask for the raise, their boss is just gonna be like, you want a raise? No, instead I'm firing you. Forbes did a study and actually found that if you don't leave a job every two years, over your lifetime, you will make half as much. Vivian Tu, the visionary behind your rich BFF, captivating over six million worldwide with her empowering financial insights. Leaving a lucrative career, Vivian embarked on a mission to transform finance into finance. Now with her groundbreaking book, Rich AF, she offers a definitive guide to mastering personal finance and getting financial freedom. The scary stuff, the scariest stuff, likely credit card debt because credit card interest rates are anywhere between 20 to 25 percent oh you millennials are bad at managing your money because you love you know going to starbucks and eating avocado toast kids that grow up with money continue to have more money they make more money they're better managing their money in your opinion has the u.s government or the department of education failed us as american citizens when it comes to financial literacy and personal financial management do i think a federally mandated financial literacy graduation requirement would certainly help yes without a doubt what do you think about if man is working and woman is sitting with kids at home they're not just sitting at home they are you know the chef they are the chauffeur they are the um, the cleaner they are everything The Avenue of the Strongest is a podcast dedicated to exploring the lives and experiences of the most inspiring individuals from around the world. Each episode features interviews with fascinating guests who share their insights and wisdom on a variety of topics, including education, impact, motivation, health, and learning. Here are your hosts, Aniette Chowdhury and Vlad Suleiman. Over the last year, 86.6% of our regular viewers have not yet hit the subscription button. Your subscription means a lot to us. It's a small gesture on your end and a huge leap forward for our channel. If you wouldn't mind, we would love to ask you if you found our channel informative and engaging, if you can please hit that subscription button. Your subscription means a lot to us. It allows us to go ahead and continue to put out great content, better guests, and as always, we will always put out two episodes per week. Thank you so much. Vivian, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. I'm super excited to have you and get to speak with you. You know, while I, I was thinking, what's a good way to start this conversation off? And obviously, your work has significantly impacted how potentially millions globally approach their finances. So to kick off our conversation, I wanted to discuss a concerning trend among Americans. Now, according to a 2023 survey by payroll.org, 78% of Americans are living paycheck to paycheck. While the exact percentage varies across different sources, I think we can both agree that at least 60% of Americans are living paycheck to paycheck, which is kind of shocking. Now, obviously, we're in a unique time right now. Considering the inflation spikes and the surge in prices for groceries and other goods and services, my question to you is, is this primarily a consequence of recent economic challenges, or is this an, indi uh, is this an indication of something much more of a long-standing issue that we have as an American society? Yeah, I would say it's certainly uh, a long-standing issue. Uh, as I'm sure you've recognized, as so many others have, wages have completely stagnated since our parents' generation. However, costs have risen on pretty much everything, especially when it comes to housing and uh, education. Educational costs have 10 x over the past 50 years, and right now it is cheaper to rent than buy in 70% of all U.S. markets. So I think it's a little frustrating when people are like, well, why don't you just pull yourself up by the bootstraps? Or, you know, I did it in my generation. It's like, well, yeah, the, the rules of the game are very, very different now. And on top of that, I think there's been a compounding issue of a lack of financial literacy. Um, when the middle class was a more prominent population in our society, you could get by with saving and it was easier to make ends meet. But now as things have gotten more expensive, wages have stayed the same, the middle class is very literally shrinking and there are fewer yeah. and fewer people who feel like they can meet all of their every single day needs based on what they're making every single year. And so I would say it is a longstanding issue. And, 
you know, it's not to say that there haven't been improvements made, but imagine slapping a Band-Aid on a broken leg and thinking, oh, we're better now. It's like, no, like you have to actually address the issue. It's like, hey, how did you break the leg in the first place? Is it a hairline fracture? Is it a major break? Like, how are we going to solve this? And we just haven't found a really good solution to the whole problem yet. Yeah. Well, so my next question, it might be a little bit bold, uh, but this is something that is uh, very meaningful for me. But in your opinion, has the U.S. government or the Department of Education failed us as American citizens when it comes to financial literacy and personal financial management? I've never had any finance classes. I don't think in general it is a core class anywhere. Uh, maybe, maybe, maybe it's coming into some high schools and middle schools. I, I, I do hear some schools saying, hey, it's, it's a requirement. But I think across the board. But not on the public system, 100%. Right. So what's going on here? I mean, is it the government's fault? Is it the Department of Education? Do, do we, should we not be financially literate? Is that a good thing? No, it's definitely not good to be financially illiterate. <laughs> uh, I, I will say it's hard to place the blame on any one specific body or one specific person. Do I think a federally mandated financial literacy graduation requirement would certainly help? Yes, without a doubt. What we're seeing right now is a lot of states, you know, uh, Florida included, where I'm currently, you know, sitting and taking this podcast from, they're starting to make state mandated requirements for graduation. So Florida now requires a financial literacy class um, to pass high school. And that's great on a state by state level. However, it'd be a lot more impactful if it was federally mandated. What we've typically seen is that kids that come from families that have generational wealth or, you know, the rich uncle or somebody who can explain finance and money to them at an earlier age, Kids who are educated around finances typically end up having more money, and right. that's no surprise to anybody. And that essentially becomes a compounding snowball effect. Kids that grow up with money continue to have more money. They make more money. They're better managing their money. But if you grow up in an economically disadvantaged neighborhood with parents who don't know how to manage their own money, you're certainly not getting that education from anybody anybody you know, anybody who's teaching you in school. And that essentially makes a bad problem worse. And again, really, really creates a bifurcation of society of people who know about money and are learning about it are getting richer. And the people who aren't getting that education are getting economically worse. Where, where is your interest came from to finances? Oh, um, well, I would say I became interested in finance because... <laughs> I didn't ever want to ask my parents for money ever again. Um, there was, I can't remember, I think it was like ninth grade. I went to the mall with a girlfriend and we both ended up getting the same pair of ripped jeans. And I thought they were so cool and so cute. And I came home and my mom found the receipt for the jeans in the bag. And she looked at them and she was like, oh my God, I can't believe you spent... I can't even remember how much it was, but how this much on broken jeans. <laughs> and we got into what I considered was probably one of the biggest fights of my adolescence. Wow. And she yelled at me and I was like, what's the big deal? Like my friend got these jeans too. And my mom just stopped talking for a second and then looked me in the eye. And she said, well, you know, her family has a lot more money than we do. Like her dad's a lawyer. Like we're not millionaires. You can't be doing this. Like we don't have this kind of money. And I could tell it really hurt her to say that, to not be able to, you know, offer me the things that, you know, one of my peers had, but I stormed up to my room. Cause I was this like grumpy teenager, whatever. I slammed the door. And at that moment I decided, I was like, I never, ever want to feel this feeling that I'm currently feeling ever again. I want to be so rich. I never have to worry about spending money. I want to be able to have everything that I want. And I think that's kind of where the hunger and interest in finance came from because I wanted to have a lot of money and it came from a place of feeling really less than, but ultimately mm. I've learned to use money as a tool to enrich my life in more ways than one. That's, that's a beautiful story. And when did you earn your first money? Yeah. 
Um, oh man, I had been earning money ever since I got into college. At the beginning, it was like, I worked at like some sketchy internship. I don't even know if this was like a real internship. We, I got paid money to like basically be a club promoter. Uh, I got paid money on campus to do those like psychological studies where mm, I would like fill yeah. out a crossword or whatever and see how fast I could do it. And like somebody would be there like monitoring me and like timing me. And I, I would like wear like a headset um just to see like where my neurons were act i don't know i would do anything for money so that i could go out and have a good time with my friends but it ended up being you know i started making more chunky amounts of money when i took on internships that were paid in the finance space so they paid decently well my internship on wall street i worked for 10 weeks and i think i got like a, a pretty solid it was like an actual analyst salary for 10 weeks so it was more money than i'd ever seen in my life i was like i'm rich now and you know when i graduated from college and ended up moving to new york and starting my full-time job when i got the when i got that first paycheck i was like on top of the world Did you go and spend it all yeah i was like how much does the earth cost um <laughs> uh i i didn't only because i really needed furniture in my apartment um, so I was like, okay, I really need to save for this thing that I need or that thing that I need. It wasn't like super fun spending, but you know, I needed the money. And so I was really excited to be able to earn it myself. This podcast is sponsored by Argo Prep, an award-winning educational publisher serving over a million students nationwide. If you're a kindergarten to eighth grade teacher or principal, be sure to check out our supplementary workbooks to get your students ready for standardized state testing. We cover all subjects from kindergarten to eighth grade. Use the coupon code AVENUE for a 25% discount off of all purchase orders. Visit us today at argoprep.com slash store. And what would you say are the best practical strategies to individuals to adapt, to navigate, to living from paycheck to, to, to paycheck, especially in this economy? I think it's really tone deaf to suggest that people can budget their way out of a deficit. If you are, if you need to spend more money than you are currently bringing in, that's not going to happen. Um, but what I will say is that you can always ask for more money. So. I always credit her with like so much of my learning, but my mentor at my very first job, she told me a line that I had never heard before, but made so much sense. She told me that you could only save as much as you earn, but you could always earn more money. And that was the first time that it clicked for me because I had heard so many times like, oh, you millennials are bad at managing your money because you love you know going to Starbucks and eating avocado toast. and I wasn't even doing any of those things because I didn't have the money to. And I was like, where is this going? Like, what do I do? And the earn more money part became so critical because it is so hard to cut out $5,000 of discretionary expenses from your life, but it is so much easier to ask for a $5,000 raise. That is totally heard of, you know, everybody knows somebody who's gotten that type of raise and it makes your life a lot easier when you aren't playing for literal pennies and you know hoping that your account doesn't overdraft once you have that buffer room it's going to be really helpful so what i always say is always be willing to one negotiate how much you're currently getting paid at your job to pick up a side hustle because it doesn't have to be you know you're working around the clock but once you get off of work if there's something that you're actually interested in doing maybe you have a desk job during the day and you just want to take a walk after work go sign up for WAG, go walk a dog while you're taking your own walk mm. and you can get paid for that time. Or maybe it's, hey, you work a physically demanding job on, during the day, you're on your feet, maybe you're a bartender or a waitress or a hostess. Then you come home and you wanna sit in front of the TV and you wanna just chill. You can take quizzes and do surveys for money from your phone. So you can get a little bit of that screen time, relax, watch a movie while you're making money from your couch. So I just always say, think about what you're doing during the day and find another way to make money that you can make easily outside of that time. She so just unlocked a very core memory that I forgot about those surveys. I, I grew up in a very low income family and mm -hmm. you know we of course had no financial literacy as you were talking about. Uh, which is a huge problem. But I remember in high school, I would, you know, because my whole thing was, how can I make money? You know, how do I yeah. make $5? And at that time, I guess it is still now, it, it, would, it would all be these quizzes. But 
honestly, back then, every time I tried to do any of those, I don't think I've ever got paid out one penny though. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> maybe I was, well, I was probably like 16 years old, 15, I was probably yeah. 15 or 14. You probably weren't time. even eligible for them. Exactly. Like you have to exactly. be 18 or older to yeah. do them. But you just unlocked a, a memory that I forgot about. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, right now times. they're actually a little different. Um, you will be essentially, you can sign up for surveys and actual product reviews as well. So not only are they quizzes or whatever, if you like are eligible for them, they'll actually send you like a gift card to go Mm -hmm. buy like a random plant and then leave a review on the packaging of the plant being mailed to you. It was like, hey, did your plant survive the shipping? And these companies then use that information to be like, hey, do we need to change our shipping provider? Mm, So I do think that they're really interesting. And it's like, a pretty nice way to just make an extra 35 bucks here, 35 bucks there. It's like, it's not certainly going to be the reason why you're able to retire, but it certainly can get you out of that paycheck to paycheck cycle. And I just mm. saw your video uh, that you posted on in, on Instagram that you can fill out some survey and you get 20% discount towards North Face. Yeah, exactly. I mean, this is something, I mean, this is what's new for me also. I never knew about this yeah. kind of things. And I like your advice Definitely. about that, uh, you have to go and ask for the raise of your salary. Yeah. I have so many friends who are afraid of going and asking because they think that they are not enough. I'm not doing enough, this and that. I mean, why people are afraid to go and ask at least? Nobody will kill them for asking. I don't, I don't know where this like nightmare cycle started, but I feel like all of my friends, they think if they go and ask for the raise, their boss is just going to be like, you want a raise? Right. No, instead I'm firing you. Like that (laughs) doesn't happen. Just so everybody knows, like that doesn't happen unless you work somewhere where frankly, you probably don't want to be anyway. What ends up most likely happening is one of three options. You go and ask for that raise and your boss says, you know what? Yes, you deserve it. You have been working so hard. We have the budget for you. Amazing. That's rare. There are other options of straight up. No, you're actually not doing a good job. You're about to be put on a performance improvement plan. Also, I would say not rare, but, you know, less likely. The most likely of thing that is what's likely to happen probably 75% of the time is you're going to go into that meeting and you're going to ask your boss for money and they're going to say, okay, thanks for sharing that. I need to go one, speak with HR to see what type of budget I'm getting for the year. And two, I'd love to know why, you know, you think you are deserving of this. Um, I need to basically check. So it's a maybe. And what I always say is create a folder in your inbox or use an envelope if you have more physical receipts. But anytime something good happens, you crush a project or snag a deal or build the company up or manage to grow at a certain amount or anything with a tangible number, forward that success to that folder. And that way at your mid-year review or your end of year review or whenever you decide to go in and ask for that raise, you literally have a laundry list of all the times you crushed it. And so when they ask, like, why do you deserve this? You have the receipts and the backup to say, this is exactly why, and this is what I want. What, what, what do you think? How many times can you ask for the raise? Like every year or twice a year or what's the... I ask for a raise every single year. Um, and what I like to do is I start during the mid-year review. So everybody likes to ask mm. around the end of year review. But the problem is your end of year review is likely around November, December, and odds are good. Budgets are already set by then. Like you're too late. So mid June, July, mid year review, I always go in with my manager and I'm like, Hey, I just wanted to, you know, have a check-in at the beginning of the year. We set some goals for me. Here's how I'm tracking towards them. I'm on track. If not above, I'm doing great. These are the things I'm working on. This is what I'm going to improve on. Just so you know, like at the level that I'm operating at, given how much revenue I've brought to the team, I believe a raise of X, Y, Z would be commensurate with the work that I'm doing and the work that I'm providing the company. No, you know, just be really honest and be like, recognize that budgets are typically set around October, September, October, happy to continue to check in, but let me know if there's anything else I can be doing to make that raise possible. That way you've put the the onus on your boss to tell you no in case you're not tracking. So then I check in every month or two and remind them of my goal, 
remind them how well I'm doing and remind them I want to raise. I'm telling you, I've done this every year in my career in the corporate world and I got a raise every year. So oh, important thing here is that you ask for the raise not just by doing nothing, you but you have to be on top of on top of your job, on top of your position. A thousand percent. You do have to be good yeah. at your job. You can't be <laughs> don't suck you at your job and go ask for the raise. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Right, exactly. You have to be good at your job, but many people are good at their jobs and they're not getting paid the way they deserve because they don't have the gall to ask and they really should. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Vivian, I would like to speak about your uh, new book. So congrats on recent mm -hmm. publishing, uh, which is now New York Times so bestseller. Much. It's called uh, Reach AF, The Winning Money Mindset That Will Change Your Life. So in one of the sections in your book, you dive into some strategies to pay off debt. And given that many of us may have bad debt, can you share some strategies on how to tackle bad debt? And could you please tell us what is good debt and what is bad debt? Yeah, so I don't necessarily like to consider things good or bad debt. What I like to say is there is growier debt. So certain types of debt grows faster and frankly is a lot scarier than other types of debt. So when you think about your debt, What's really important to note is the interest rate or essentially how quickly that debt compounds. Scary stuff, the scariest stuff, likely credit card debt because credit card interest rates are anywhere between 20 to 25%. So if you don't pay that off, you're going to be paying a lot more for those purchases later on. Alternatively, then you go down the line and you got stuff kind of like personal loan debt, car loan debt. Below that, you've got mortgages. And if you if you graduated college around the time that I graduated college, federal student loans were being offered at like three to four percent. So like that's much less scary and less growy debt as much as we talk about the student debt crisis. Like student loan debt, if you have like a three or four percent interest rate, truly is not the worst thing. It's not yeah. bad to have. However, the easiest way to pay down your debt in the, in the fastest amount of time is using something called the avalanche method. You rank your debt from highest to lowest interest rate. You make the minimum payment across everything. And then any additional funds you have for debt pay down, you put towards the debt with the highest interest rate. This helps you basically ax the scariest, growiest debt first. And then once you kind of get to the lower interest rate debt, you can continue to pay that off slow and steady while also starting to invest. That's, uh, that's very good advice. Now, I know earlier we were talking about the importance of increasing our earning power mm -hmm. over just saving money. And I think that's a very something very important to talk about because you're right. I think we all, over the course of our lifetime here, you need to save money. You need to stop spending money, right? It doesn't matter what your salary is. Just save more of that money. But there's a, there's a much bigger part of that equation if you really want to be financially independent or if you, if, if you, if you want to have a couple million dollars to retire, which is increasing your earning power. If you're not mm -hmm. taking a look into that part of the equation, it's going to be really hard for you because saving $200 or $300 or even a couple thousand, it, it puts a limit. So I, so I do want to spend some time talking about this. My question to you, because we're so you've covered some stuff about asking for a promotion. Are there any other ways that one can increase their earning power? Do you recommend job hopping, or do you just recommend, you know, finding a company that has a good manager? Because once you have a good manager, you'll much more likely get promoted every twelve or eighteen months, depending on the company. What are what are some ways for the average American to increase their earning power? Yeah, I'm a huge fan of job hopping. Um, I know my parents' generation were like, no, you're not a company loyalist. Like, you're bad. Shame on you. But right now, if you're not job hopping every two years or at least getting a really meaningful promotion or raise at your current job every two years, you are going to be missing out on 50% of your lifetime earnings. Forbes did a study and actually found that if you don't leave a job every two years, over your lifetime, you will make half as much. I cannot afford to make half as much. The, <laughs> the concept of like company loyalty comes from back in the day in our parents and grandparents generation, there were things called pensions. So you were incentivized to stay at a company for as long as humanly possible because they would fund your retirement. And the longer you stayed, the more they owed you. So people would be like, okay, like I don't mind not making as much now, but 
because I've been at this company for 30 years, I'm going to have a really great guaranteed retirement that my company is on the hook for. Correct. However, with the invention of the 401k, pensions have all but gone extinct. And with 401ks, the impetus is no longer on our companies to save for our retirement, but on us. So we need to have more money to be able to set that money aside. And two, we need to look out for number one, because there is no incentive to really be staying at a company long haul now. You need to go somewhere that is going to pay you as much as humanly possible, provide you the best benefits humanly possible, and look out for yourself. Because corporations at any point, if it no longer made financial sense to keep you around, they would ax you. You would, you would be chopped. And I say that like companies are selfish. You need to be selfish too. Because if you're not and you're like, oh, I need to look out for the company, the company does not care about you. Your coworkers might care about you. Your boss might care about you. People care about you. But your company is a corporate entity. The Correct. company itself does not care about you. And you need to look out for yourself first. Uh, you know, what, what, what is funny, other day I was going to Costco and in Costco, every employee, they have a badge. And on the badge, it's saying how many years they are with the Costco. I know. And I was shocked when I saw somebody 35 years. I will say Costco is great Costco. Things. Yeah. Costco is a little bit of an anomaly because they provide like unbelievable pay and corporate benefits to their employees. So when you do find a company that provides, you know, certain types of benefits or a level of pay that you're unlikely to get elsewhere. Yeah. People will stick around. That's why yeah. you see, um, all of these tech companies offering, you know, IVF treatments or adoption mm. fee waivers or um, sabbaticals or, you know, really incredible benefits that you're not going to see elsewhere because they're all trying to compete for the best talent. And when you offer people more money and better benefits, they'll come to you. And so you will get the smartest people. You will get the hardest working. You will get, you know, the people who are most sought after because you're literally paying them more. Like that's exactly how that works. <laughs> Since this is on top of mind, I actually want to ask your thoughts about AI. Now, I, you know, we're not sitting here as experts in artificial intelligence, but obviously this is, we've seen amazing tools come out mm -hmm. from your perspective, from, you know, you create a lot of content as well. So what are your general thoughts on AI and the general uh, landscape of how people should be feeling? The, the, uh, the, the average American, I'm, I'm going to uh, yeah. the average American. Listen, I think I have a very middle of the fairway view when it comes to AI. I think in some regards, it can be incredibly helpful. It's going to help me basically chop down on menial tasks, like taking my own notes during a meeting. Great. Like I don't have to do that anymore. Or if I need to summarize something, I can use AI to just kind of quickly scan. But ultimately, I think there's a level of human creativity or human touch that needs to kind of give the final check. I certainly don't use AI to create my content because it would mm. literally come out sounding like a robot. I yeah. promise you, at the end of the day, when AI continues to grow, I think it's a tool that you can use wisely. I don't think it's going to take over humans the way that people are you know spreading rumors i do think that there are certain jobs that are you know the type of jobs that are very repetitive or similar motion or similar process or similar task that likely can be replaced with ai but i do think that'll actually open up and free up different types of jobs for people who used to do those jobs to do in the future because ultimately there needs to be a human check on ai to make sure that it still makes sense yeah. No, oh, and I I, 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 gen I I do agree with that sentiment as well. The only thing I would add, but my personal view is for anyone that's listening to make sure that you're always on top of your game. You can't be lazy. I mean, you always have to educate yourself. You have to be willing to adapt. You have to be willing to learn new skills because, you know, things are evolving fast. And if you're, if you can't catch on, I think we're going to have some issues because AI might AI may not replace all the jobs, but instead of a company when when they meet and they do their budgets, instead of hiring 
10 designers, they may only need two. Now you multiply that across all the other companies. What do you see? So we've seen that with our company as well. You know, we used to hire a lot of, uh, you know, copywriters and editors and teachers across the board to create content. And we don't use AI to create content, but these tools, what they allow us to do is what, like it cuts, it, it increases employee productivity by about 300%. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of scary when you, when you use that number and you just multiply it across all the companies. So, so my, I, I, I don't think people should be scared, but I think people should be willing to adapt and always learn, always be eager to learn. That's my my opinion. People people should use it to increase their eff uh, to their effectiveness at job, and this will allow them to go ahead and ask for the raise. Exactly. Yeah, I mean that. Yeah, that too. Now, Vivian, I do want to ask you, uh, what's one piece of financial advice you wish you'd received earlier in your life? Ooh, I love I love this one because I made a lot of this mistake in my early twenties. Um, don't buy things you don't need with money you don't have to impress people you don't like. Mm. Um, you know, I think, especially as a woman, like you certainly get caught up with the cool girl. Um, you know, you, you see some people with this new designer bag or the right shoes or the right outfit and you want to buy those things too. And suddenly you're like, I have a closet full of junk and it was all very expensive junk and nothing really to show for it emotionally. You get that little high when you buy it, you know, when you swipe your credit card, but it doesn't build long lasting happiness. Um, my mentor, when I first met her, I wanted to be like her so badly for very shallow reasons. She would walk into work with her Gucci stiletto shoes, click clacking on the mm. floors and a brand new designer bag every single day. And I was like, wow, this person is so rich. I want to be just like her. Ultimately, I realized that the richness wasn't in those things, but the fact that she was able to take her mom on an all expenses paid vacation or be able to take her family out to dinner when they came to visit her or when she went home. And being able to gift experiences or provide a better life or even just buy back some of her own time, um, that is richness. That optionality, mm -hmm. that freedom, that freedom of choice, the ability to make decisions that don't necessarily take money as a factor, that is richness. That's being truly free. And I don't think we should try to get on the consumer hamster wheel of constantly wanting the next coolest thing. Cause it's not healthy. You're never going yeah. to be happy. Oh, a thousand percent. You know, I remember you mentioned in, on one of your interviews, the story about that, um, the self-made women's who, who buying like thousand dollar fake, nice bag yes, or something like yes. that, instead of going and buying the original ones. Yeah. So, the New Yorker did a piece on New York City women, um, in particular, very powerful, very wealthy New York City women who are some of the richest in the world. And they typically live, you know, Upper East Side, Upper West Side. These are cool, these are cool ladies. And many of them are buying high end designer fakes like Birkins, mm. Kelly's, you know, really, really crazy fakes. And choosing to do that over buying the real thing, even though some of them, you know, are making $3 million a year, like they can certainly afford it. They can certainly buy one. And the view was, you know, a lot of these women felt like they weren't real housewives. Like they actually worked for their money. So they didn't want to spend it on something super frivolous, but they also recognized that looking and dressing a certain way allowed them access into networks and communities that would ultimately help their careers or help their lives socially and socioeconomically. So they wanted to look the part. And so they just buy, bought really nice fakes and nobody knew the difference. So they were like, why should I stop doing it if no one can tell? 100%. Let's speak about uh, newbies in investment, especially we saw a lot of newbies came during the pandemic <laughs> with all these new platforms came in and everybody started to trade and became financial experts right away gurus. right away, gurus. oh my gosh yeah. kill me so what advice do you give to such people to someone who 
just starting to explore investing? Is it just simply putting money to index fund and dollar cost averaging or there's more? Into yeah, it? I would say um, I think that's, you know, very prudent advice, just dollar cost averaging into index funds. But if the phrase dollar cost averaging into index funds makes your head spin, one of the easiest things to do is just utilize a robo advisor. Um, essentially, you take a quick quiz about your money goals, how much you make, how much you have, when you're trying to retire, what your lifestyle looks like, and they'll pick a diversified portfolio of investments for you. The issue that a lot of uh, the issue that a lot of newbie investors run into is that they are not fully diversifying their portfolio. So what they tend to do is they're like, okay, I love this stock. I'm going to buy a bunch of this stock. Okay, what happens if that stock or that company comes under, you know, a PR nightmare, or they find out that one of the products doesn't work, or their drug didn't pass phase three trials, or something happens, and that company tanks, so does your entire investment portfolio. Whereas when you have a diversified portfolio, you are able to better weather, you know, upticks and downturns. Um, why I like a robo advisor is sometimes that even with index funds, you can be overexposed in certain areas and underexposed in others. A robo advisor is really going to help you. Um, and it's most important to just get started as soon as possible. And a robo advisor can get you invested in 45 minutes um, and you don't even have to learn how to do it yourself. Uh, this is a great way to start investing right now today. And then as you have your money in the robo advisor, start learning a little bit more about investing on your own and how that makes you feel. And if you're you know, willing to dedicate the time and effort that it's going to take for you to do that. I like how, how you said, I will pick the stock that I love. I love the yeah. stock. You're supposed to do a nice research before investing, not just love the company yeah. or the stock. <laughs> but you know, there are so many people who are like, I love this yeah, stock I love just because I love it. And the, uh, yeah, like it's like, oh, yeah, like cool, you have an iPhone. Doesn't necessarily mean you should be investing in the company. Um, right. <laughs> and that's not to say that like personal use or interest is not a valid reason to invest, but there's just a lot more to it. And I think people who are regular people who don't look through financial statements don't recognize that. And that's why it's a lot easier to kind of just um, essentially buy baskets of Halloween candy instead of putting all of your investment into just one candy bar. Right. So next I would like to speak about a very nice topic, which is um, uh, relationship, marriage and finances. So yeah. surprisingly, we see that many couples are shy away talking about their personal finances and debt. So from your perspective, at what point in relationship should couples start having serious conversation about finances? What's the right time? I think as soon as they start dating or like, frankly, the first, first date, 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 first date. And listen, the how much first, debt do you have? <laughs> no. Okay. Listen, you're not like, show me your pay stub. Um, right. But on your first date, I really do think you should be talking about money. Uh, and it doesn't have to be so aggressive. It can just be like, if money wasn't a factor, what would your dream vacation be? Because someone who says, I would ball out on a villa and bring all of my friends, we're going to go to Thailand, is a very different person than someone who's like, I don't know, I might just take a long weekend and drive up to XYZ. I think that those two people are great for two very different partners, but you need to know what type of person you are. And once you have the easy stuff like that, you know, I think the first date, you also have to talk about who's paying for the date. Are you splitting it? Who's paying? Um, then when you start to date more seriously, you can talk a little bit more about, uh, how you want to split costs going forward. When you start thinking about seriously dating that person, calling them your significant other, it's, Hey, like, are we supposed to move in together? Do you want to do that? Like, should we, should we talk about how we're going to split expenses when we are starting to share things like utilities and somebody's got to pay for toilet paper? Like which one of us is it going to be? Are we splitting it? Like what's going on? And then as long as you're starting to talk about finance early and often in your relationship, it'll become less and less awkward. So by the time you get to the really important stuff of, Hey, like we're getting engaged, like how are we going to create a joint account or what's getting paid from the joint account? Do we keep separate accounts still? How are we paying for the wedding? Should we buy a home? 
How much are kids going to cost? How many do you want? Do we want to take care of our in-laws in old age? Like all of these questions are a little bit scarier. But if you've been having the money talk since date number one, it's going to feel a lot less intimidating. And my fiance and I, we've been together for now almost seven years. We've certainly had our fair share of fights, but we have never once fought about money. Mm. What do you think about if man is working and woman is sitting with kids at home? You know, I think even just the way that you said that is really downplaying the amount of unpaid labor that stay at home parents have to do. Uh, they're not just sitting at home. They are, you know, the chef, they are the chauffeur, they are the, um, the cleaner, they are everything. And oftentimes when there is a stay at home parent, I think there should be a conversation about the finances of like, Hey, I am giving up a well-paying career to do this. Like we need to make sure that we are financially equitable and that I feel like I still have access to my own money. Even if you're not earning it for the home, the only reason your partner is able to go out and bring home the bacon is because you take care of everything at home. So I would just say, I think everybody should be getting a prenuptial agreement, get a prenup and discuss what it's going to look like if things don't work out. The same way that people buy car insurance or health insurance, you don't expect to get a kidney stone. You don't expect to total your car, but these things do happen. And no one who's ever gotten a prenup has ever said, oh, I regret getting a prenup. But plenty of people who didn't get them do say, I regret not getting one. So highly recommend getting a prenup in your relationship. I'd like to chime in very quickly about the stay-at-home moms. So I I have a five-month-old daughter. I mean, Vlad has two kids, but I have a five-month-old daughter. And to anybody that's listening right now, if you're a stay-at-home mom, or if you're on the other side of the equation and you think that a stay-at-home mom or you know stay-at-home parent is easy. I can promise you firsthand that nothing I've done in my life compares to trying to take care of my child. I've, I, you know, I'll take care of her 15 hours a day. Trust me, it is far harder than running several companies, doing anything. So I want to say that being a stay-at-home mom or dad or whoever it is, it is a very hard job. If you're a good parent. It is a very is it hard easier job. To run a so company? Vlad, you know what? It is far easier to run a company. It is significantly easier to run a company uh, than raise a child. Uh, you know, to give to give a hundred percent to that child, which I, I think a lot of stay at home moms do. Or I won't discount the stay at home dads, but I just wanted to chime in there because I don't think anybody who disagrees should be the primary stay at home parent for at least five days and see how you feel. And I, I think that your mind will change very quickly about just how much value they add, because trust me, they're, they're worth, I would, I, I'd probably say double or triple your salary of what you're making right now in terms of what they provide. It's 24 seven around the job. Yeah, 100%. I have, I, 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 I have one follow-up question for my previous one. So if I have a debt, for example, before I entering the relationship and I have my, my debt, should I discuss it from the very beginning or? Yeah, I think you should be really honest about your financial situation because um, sex and money are the top two reasons why couples fight. And mm. frankly, if I was dating someone and you know we had gotten pretty serious and they didn't come forward with that information, I would feel like they were hiding it from me. And there's not anything that I want my partner to hide from me unless they're trying to plan me a surprise birthday party. So uh, I, I think, but wouldn't it be wouldn't it be so weird to discuss? Okay, hi, I'm on our first date. I have a debt, by the way. No, not you don't have to bring it up on your first date. First but, thirty days. No, but I do think first like if you're days. seriously <laughs> if you're seriously considering a life with someone, you can share like, hey, just so you know, like I want to make sure that like we start our life together on solid financial footing. I want to be really honest in that I have X Y Z amount of debt from whatever you might have it from. And I want you to know that so you're able to make a you know educated decision about how you feel about us putting our finances together. Because if you don't share that information and you hide it, if you have hidden credit card debt or a hidden student loan or hidden anything, it's financial infidelity. Yeah. I don't care. You're lying to me. And I don't want to be lied to in any situation unless it's you know for a happy surprise. So I just think that 
you should be honest. You don't need to be so honest on your first date just because that can certainly scare people away. But in the same way that you're not like, oh, by the way, like I have like a toenail that's ingrown on your first date. You're not sharing that. But ultimately, if someone loves you or someone really cares about you, I highly doubt that like your one weird toenail is going to be the big turnoff in the same way that if you've already decided to build a life with someone, you want to make sure that your partner understands the full picture of your financial situation, because maybe if you have half a million dollars in debt, they don't want to hitch their wagon to your horse and that you should be okay with that. Vivian, uh, what a great time, by the way, what what a great conversation. We have just three uh, remaining questions for you uh, and then we'll wrap up. Uh, But I do want to talk a little bit about this because this week or this month slash last month, we've seen uh, a resurgence of cryptocurrency, a lot of people pumping in their money Mm -hmm. and institutions as well. So with Bitcoin hitting an all time high this week, Ethereum having a major surge right now, what are your thoughts on cryptocurrency as an investment option? Do you believe it has a place in someone's investment portfolio? And under what circumstances might it be considered a wise addition to that portfolio? Yeah, for sure. Um, So full disclosure, I own Bitcoin and Ethereum. But the one thing that I always say is that cryptocurrency is not a bad investment, but it certainly shouldn't be a like a husky portion of your investment portfolio, because I don't want to see people investing in cryptocurrency until they've already maxed out all of their tax advantaged retirement accounts. Mm, They already feel really confident with their emergency fund. They've paid down any high interest rate debt. Like there are 18 steps you should be doing before you get to cryptocurrency. Cryptocurrency is a nice to have. It is a bonus. And frankly, any dollar that you put into crypto, you should be ready to lose because it is an incredibly volatile asset class. It is frankly, not nearly regulated enough even now. And you just don't know. The amount of money I have in cryptocurrency is a fraction of a fraction of a fraction of my entire investment portfolio. I have investments in public equities, in bonds, in um, certain private investments, you know, whether that be private equity, like startups, anything. I own a home. I max out all of my tax advantaged accounts every single year. I do all of that before I even like start to smell the thought of cryptocurrency. Yeah. And I would say never, ever have crypto be more than one to 5% of your entire investment portfolio. And I know that your goal is to have 25 mil invested under 4%. Mm-hmm. This is very conservative, 4%. Where, yeah, is, it, where, where, where is this coming from? Yeah, so 4% is essentially um, a very conservative investment return. If I get eight, if I get 10, which is, you know, the S&P 500 has returned eight to 10% every single year since its inception, like that's more likely, but anything additional is gravy. I want to make sure a super, super conservative return is still able to fund my lifestyle. And once I have that, I know I'm going to be able to really downshift in my career or at least downshift in opportunities that I that I take because I need to pay rent or pay for my expenses, I don't necessarily need to work for money anymore at that point. I can take on a lot more pro bono work. I can do a lot more charity and philanthropic work because I don't need the money. I just want to do it. How long is your goal? When when are you expecting to hit your goal? I mean, as soon as possible. Uh, I'd love to do, be able to do it in the next 10 years, uh, but that's to be seen. So we'll see how much okay. money I make. We'll, we'll follow up on that. Yeah, <laughs> uh, Vivian, who I, and I, I think I know the answer, but maybe it's somebody else. But uh, I want to ask you, who's been the most influential person in your financial education journey? And what was one of the most valuable lessons they've taught you? Yeah, so it is definitely my first manager at my first job, my mentor. She's still my mentor now. I see her regularly. She's the best. Um, one of the most important pieces of advice she ever taught me was to be a high value person and also recognize that value. So don't let other people, other like companies cheapen you. So when someone in your life is not treating you with respect or they only, you know, they're taking you for granted, don't put up with that. She always Mm -hmm. told me that you don't need that person as much as they need you. Feel free to cut them out of your life in the same way that if you are in a workplace where you are not being treated with respect. You are not given the opportunities you deserve, given how hard you work and how well you're doing. It's time to go. And 
she was always the first person to remind me that I had value. I was worthy. I deserved all of the things that I wanted. And all I had to do was ask for them. It's so beautiful. Thanks so much for sharing that. You know, I love when people get nice mentors on their life. I mean, this is very important yeah. besides parents, because we can we can uh, affect our kids all the way possible, all, all we want. But if they're going to, you know, meet the right mentor at the job or I don't know, at the university or college anywhere. I mean, this is very huge. Um, yes. My last question would be, um, if this was the last time you could share your message with the world, what would you, what mm. would you want your final piece of advice be? Ooh, okay. So it's actually a quote. Um, so Francis Picabia said, our heads are round, so our thoughts can change direction. Um, I feel like when I was kind of like coming up, maybe end of college, start of my career, I very much had the mindset that people should just work harder because I was working so hard and it would just be easier. But I've come to realize that that isn't true. We aren't all given the same opportunities. We're not all given a fair shake. And life, frankly, is very hard for many, many people. And we need to give them grace. And we should give ourselves grace when things don't work out the way we want them to. Ultimately, like kind of the takeaway here is that like, when you are presented with new information, you are allowed to get smarter. You don't have to like die on every hill of every opinion you've ever had. Mm -hmm. When you learn more as we get smarter and more experienced and wiser and older, frankly, you are allowed to change your opinion. And I think that's really, really powerful because it just reminds me that all of us can afford to be a little bit better every single day. What a great message, Vivian. Thank you so much for your time. It's been a wonderful conversation. Is there anything else that you want to share with us or uh, leave with our audience today? Yeah. Um, or where can they find where they can they find you? Well, I'm sure many of our viewers may be familiar with your work already, but go ahead. Yeah. Um, if everybody wants to check out my book, Rich AF, The Winning Money Mindset, That'll Change Your Life, you can snag a copy at richaf.me. It's literally a manifestation as the URL. Um, you can listen to my podcast at Net Worth and Chill. And if you want to follow me on social, I am your rich BFF across all platforms. Vivian, thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you for having me.